Cowboy, and isn't that a great, great tune? There's a little bit more of it. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, the Pigram Brothers from West Kimberley on Wadangari Media here in the East Kimberley. It is 10 minutes past eight and you're on Wadangari Radio. We've got two special guests. One of them is from the West Kimberley, our local MLA, Davina Diana, and uh, MLC, uh, Stephen Dawson, joining us in the studio. Hello to you both. Good morning, Fiona. Good morning. Hello, and we are going Facebook Live, so a quick wave to everyone watching out there. Davina, you first of all, you've been our local member since uh, the March 2021 election and you're based in Broome, you travel a hell of a lot. This is your first time on Wadangari Radio, so welcome. How's it going? Uh, it's, it's been good. It's been, um, I can't believe that it's been three years already, um, but it's always great. I apologise in advance for taking three years to get on Wadangari, but um yeah, it's always great to be back in the East Kimberley. Uh, I used to live here before, so I'm always connected to... So when was that, Davina? Um, in the early 90s and the early 2000s as well. And I used to work next door, so... Did you, KLC? Yeah. Uh, well, it's not going to take another three years for you to come back on the radio. <laughs> and uh, let's welcome in MLC Stephen Dawson as well, but from South Hedland. Yeah, well, actually, my office is in South Hedland, but I've just moved back to Broome. Very recent. Oh, so, uh, lovely, great. Well. Awesome. So you're a local from the Kimberley as well. We'll find out a little bit more about you, Stephen. But a few questions to you, Davina. How has the week gone? So tell me about who was here. We know that the Premier was here. And tell me what, what took place this week in the East Kimberley. Oh, look, I think um, uh, over past visits coming up to the East Kimberley, I think there was a lot of um, calls for... Uh, having an opportunity to speak to ministers and the Premier direct. So uh, the Premier, the, the Premier Roger Cook, Deputy Premier Rita Safiotti, uh, we also had uh, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and Education, Honourable Tony Booty. Uh, we've had the Housing, Homelessness and... Um, housing, Homelessness and something else, I forget. Lands, Minister. And lands. Planning and lands. Uh, Minister John Kerry also come up. We also had uh, Minister Paul Papalia, who does police, veterans, uh, corrections. Um, so you had everyone. Yeah, yeah, we had a really heavy set and quite quite specific, or not specific, quite relevant to the region. We had Honourable Don Punch for regional development, seniors, disability. Um, and of course, uh, my good friend here, Honourable Stephen Dawson, emergency services. Well, I'll, I'll let you do your spiel later. Cause yes, he, and I, I didn't have your, title. And I didn't have your mic on, sorry, Stephen. That's why Kevin popped in, so I apologise about that. Well, before I get the takeouts of this week from you, Davina, let's find out a little bit about you. You've just moved to Broome. Emergency services, of course, is a huge thing. Um, floods every year, and the one last year was huge. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You you came from Ireland, and this is um, you're in the, you're in MLC, so you're in the upper house. That's right. So I did come from Ireland many years ago. I've been based in uh, Headland for uh, for the last ten years, but had a place in Broome. But we've just moved back to Broome very recently, so I keep my office in Headland, and I look after emergency services, innovation, digital economy medical research, science, and I assist the Premier with his portfolio of state and industry development jobs and trade. So a big bucket of things, big mm. basket of things, but the, the thing that does keep me the busiest is emergency services. And yeah. so Davina and I have been kept busy, particularly uh, with Fitzroy floods last year and, and, and you know helping get that community back on track again. And I think we've done a pretty good job and I'm very grateful to the, the leadership uh, of the Aboriginal community in the Fitzroy Valley in particular, mm. because it's been a tremendous effort. As key ministers in those, port well, you for, for the Kimberley and you for emergency services, how is uh, Fitzroy Crossing going? You've built the bridge in record time. Well, congratulations. After a lot of criticism, uh, the government finally did build it in quick time. How is the community going in terms of rebuilding? Because it was devastated. Oh, I, le I think the um, community has uh, re been rebuilding itself over the last 12 months. Really. It hasn't fully recovered. Though. It hasn't fully recovered, that's correct. But I think there's a sense of, um, I guess things are getting better. There are some other benefits uh, that has 
been impacted on the community after the floods. So I guess it has the flood has shone a light on some of the other gaps that um, have brought more attention to the community. But we've got um, one of the successes is the bridge, and I say one of the successes is the bridge and the um, the ability to have a lot of employment and a bit of buzzing around the community. And just recently, there's also been an announcement while. Well, to tap into that momentum of um, having work for locals and stuff is about doing the Brooking Channel. I think uh, the government just committed to upgrading the Brooking Channel as well. So while we can still tap into uh, those locals that are actually employed at the moment, getting them more skills and qualifications and utilising them to give them um, mm -hmm. some more purpose in, in Fitzroy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, wh while the bridge, the, the, the damage from the, the flooding was, was huge, the the rebuild has been really successful. I mean, it, probably not rocket science, but you give people a job, and people have got money to you know to spend on nice things. Uh, kids go to school, and you know, and and you know, uh, crime rates drop. So we've made a commitment to not only rebuild the bridge and Brooking Channel, but also to create a pipeline of work to keep people employed. And it's been great. It's been great to see old people, young people middle-aged people work on the bridge and we want to keep that going for, mm. you know, for the next few years and on into the future. Well, as uh, Minister for Emergency Services, in terms of preparedness, because of course floods happen every year, they're getting more and more severe as we saw last year. And we were, clo we were um, closed off, of course, for a couple of weeks. We couldn't get food in. That's one of the huge issues here. We couldn't get fresh food in. Um, how are we going to be better prepared next year? So I guess we're worked a couple of things. We're working with the the supermarkets, so the the Coles, the Met Cashers who own IGA. But they simply couldn't get food in. No, either. to make sure that they've got more of a supply in the region. So do we need a storage facility, Stephen? I think we do, uh, and and I think those you know those companies sell and take our money on a daily basis, and it's important that they make sure that they can deliver in times of, of floods. Uh, but we are working with the feds because what, what we saw last year was um, we saw you know the road across the north closed. Obviously, we lost the Fitzroy Bridge. At the same time, we had fires in the south. And so mm. the train line in the south was, was closed, as was the, the highway um, over east um, the, you know, to Eucla or from Eucla. So it was, it was a challenge. So we're making sure that there's more preparedness done, that there is more supply locally. And we're also looking at, uh, well, we've made an announcement about having a boat, so having um, a shipping line available that will be able to move stuff across the coast. So a previous And they'll be able to bring in fresh food and vegetables because that's one of the issues. So during emergency situation, we should be able to get fresh food and vegetables in. Yeah. Normally there are strict quarantine controls. Absolutely. Right? And, and, you know, but, but when all the roads close and you're cut off, it is a challenge. And so that's why we've made a, a decision to invest into a ship. But and will so, there be an exemption during emergency situations for? Well, we've got to work with the Commonwealth on that. We can certainly bring stuff from, from Western Australia. So we can bring stuff from Perth or Broome or wherever, depending on where the, the closure might be. The reality is with climate change, we are seeing more floods and fires. We're seeing them more frequently and we are seeing them being more challenging. So it is important that we use every kind of tool available, hence, using a ship because while the bridge the roads are closed a ship can get around the coast to deliver stuff locally. just one more question on on that Stephen the storage facility I know that food bank last year were trying to raise some money I think they needed a million dollars for a, a permanent uh, storage facility for food how's that going is this, is the state government uh, investing in that look I'm not aware of food bank uh, food banks challenge but, but does the WA government have a plan for a permanent food storage facility well we're working with the the, the, the shops because they're the ones, so we're not in the, the business of selling food. These companies are. So it'd be up to them to build one? It's up to them, and we're working with them to see how we can make sure that they've got a, a decent supply of food locally. What we will do in times of crisis is help them, and so sometimes it's using aircraft, but in future we're now going to have boats to be able to ship things in, get them to Wyndham, and then get them down to, mm. to Kononara. But we certainly work with, um, with remote shops and remote communities, for example. So every year um, around kind of... Uh, wet season time, we help uh, community stores to you know to, to, to fly stuff in, so food, water, but obviously when you have a national highway out, that makes mm. it a bit more challenging. It certainly does. Our local member, uh, local MLA, uh, Davina, just on that climate change, you've been you've been here all your life, 
and there would be no doubt, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but things are getting more severe. Um, in terms of the future, I've seen projections of parts of the north, including Broome, where you're from, are going to be unlivable in those couple of months of the year where we had 47 degrees in November and December. Does that, that obviously concerns you if, if it's going to be unlivable, particularly for older people in those, you know, by 2050, I think I, I saw the projection, which is extraordinary. That's not far away. Yeah, it's not it's it's not that far away, and and it is quite concerning um, for a lot of our old people as well who as as uh, the environment heats up, and and the projections are showing higher and longer heat waves. Um, we know a lot of our mobs. Not everyone has an air condition, um, as well to keep them. So we do get concerned about not the only the impact on the environment, but the impact on our. Our, our people as well. Davina, just remind us who your mobs are for people in the <coughs> East Kimberley who don't know. I normally ask this at the beginning, not oh. halfway through an interview. Oh, my mobs is everyone. No, just <laughs> um, well, you are quite mixed, aren't you? I am. I am. Uh, my, I am proudly a Yaru Bari and Nimbabwe woman. Um, uh, my other families have also tracing back their connections to Gidja people around Bow River. Uh, my husband comes is a Ngaranyan man from uh, the back ranges here, but grew up in Wyndham. So my children are a good mix of East and West. But um, you know, I've, I've just been to uh, Warman the other day with Minister Punch, and you know, there's always someone that we're all related to someone through marriage or yeah. blood or something all along the way, right through the Kimberley. But you're a Cox. Oh yes, I am a As Cox. Well. That's right, Deanna is my married name. Um, but I am a Cox. Uh, predominantly, there are a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> We've got Coxes on the west side. Coxes are so big that we categorise them. We have the Kananara Coxes, which are famous around here. We've got the Peninsula Coxes, we've got the Nook and Bar Coxes, and we've got uh, the Coxes in Horse Creek. But we all one mob. Wow. Well, we've got two on our board, David and Dion. Mm. I'm sure you know them. Um, thank you. This is a reminder, listener, that we're talking with our local MLA, Davina Anna, and uh, MLC, Stephen Dawson, who's now based in Broome as well. I've got a few more questions because they've got to rush off. It's their last day during their visit of the East Kimberley. Look, just talking, Davina, I had, uh, I had quite a few questions for the Premier the other day that people sent in. We asked people to send in questions um, online, but we couldn't get to them. Uh, we didn't have that much time. But since we're talking about climate change, you're very aware that, of course, development and fracking is a huge issue um, in the in the Kimberley. Uh, I know that the WA government has banned fracking in the Dampier Peninsula, but uh, it hasn't banned fracking in the rest of the Kimberley, your region. Uh, that you represent. Where do you stand on fracking in the in the Kimberley? Can I ask you that? Well, while you worked that out, can I answer <laughs> it? Because I was the Environment Minister for our first four years, so I created our Aboriginal Ranger Program and expanded our national parks. And one of the decisions we made was uh, to limit hydraulic fracturing in particular areas. So it wasn't just the Dampier Peninsula, but it's also in national parks, con the conservation estate as well, which protects our most unique areas. The challenge is, I mean, and we're, you know, the state is a great place for solar and wind, but we haven't got, we haven't got, we haven't got the generation capability at this stage to solely rely on solar and wind. We will need gas as a transitional fuel. So we've made a decision as a state to move out of coal. So our, you know, our coal mines um, will, well, our coal power, coal fired power stations will close over the next few years. We're you know, protecting our old growth forests in the southwest. We won't be able to log those trees and use them to burn anymore. And so gas will be needed. But from in the fracking? Interim. Well, gas, gas will be needed. So whether it's onshore or offshore gas. Uh, and so, I mean, there's. But fracking's different, isn't it? Well, fracking gas is a bit well, different. There, there was a parliamentary inquiry a few years ago, and there's been studies around the world that shows that it can be done safely with the right safeguards in place. Um, there's, not a, there's, there's pilots happening at the moment, but there's not wholesale fracking taking place in Western Australia. So it hasn't made sense economically for a company. But just across the border in the Northern Territory, we've of course saw the green light some months ago by the NT government and it is taking place there. And there are uh, there's a lot of 
um, exploring of uh, our region for fracking? Well, there's probably been exploring for our, for our region for, forever, for everything. So whether it's minerals or indeed gas, so that the exploration can take place. But the, the, the safeguards that have been put in place by the, the, the parliament in Western Australia are so stringent that it'll only be those projects that meet the highest thresholds could ever uh, get across the line, but it's not making but economic sense to do it at this stage. Okay, but it sounds like the WA government's certainly open to it. Well, the laws now would allow for it to take place in certain circumstances, but there's so much of the land protected and TOs have a right, uh, which, which doesn't exist in other places, TOs have a right to say, we don't want it on our country. Davina, can I ask you as a local, are you comfortable with that, your government's position on fracking? Oh, look, um, as, as my colleague has said, there are quite strict um, processes in place, uh, but also one of the other things is predominantly the TOs having, traditional owners having the right to have a say on their country um, and whether, you know, they deem it. And, and of course, it's, not, it's about being educated on on what it is, how they're going to do it. There has been a lot of exploration through our region for a very long time, I know that for a fact. Um, and it's been on the back, you know, people have been talking about fracking for years. Um, but again, as, as Minister Dawson has said, there has been quite strict rules and guidelines and, and hurdles, I guess, to reach before any decision is made, and one of them is including um, allowing traditional owners to have a say on what should and shouldn't happen in their own country. Well, just on that, how do traditional owners feel about it? Um, it's it's mixed. Look, I, I'm not going to sit here as a, a Aboriginal person and speak on everyone's behalf and everyone's traditional country. Um, there are some traditional owners that are that are uh, strongly. Uh, against it and that that has always made their message clearing and always um, talking but there's also um, some other traditional owners and communities that are open to having talks about uh, what does it look like you know how, how can we do this what 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 benefits can it do as well can I ask where you personally sit look I personally believe that um, and I've asked this before I guess I'm not one to just read the snapshots on the things, see, see the whole, um, you know, social media and news is, is, is quite a big thing and a lot of people get the first instance um, reaction of what's being, being portrayed out there. I, I believe in doing your own research for everybody. Um, I have had some looking into some of the uh, methodology of fracking, um, but I strongly believe that wherever they a company, wherever they decide to be fracking, I really would stand behind traditional owners in their decision of what what they want to do in their country. So whatever they decide for their, their area, their yes. land. Great. Okay, well, we've got a few minutes left. So um, I'll go to you, back to you, uh, Stephen. Your takeouts for the week? Look, it's been a really positive week. So as Davina said, we had the Premier, Deputy Premier. We have had five other ministers here. So that's, you know, almost half the Cabinet. And we've been able to do a range of things. We had tourism breakfasts and community meetings. Really positive, good feedback. Uh, I think people appreciated having the Premier and ministers here. Mm. Um, people weren't shy in, in raising their issues with us. I heard. Uh, which is but, but, but good, but in, in a respectful way. And so it's given us ideas about things that local people up here want, whether it's in, in Kununurra itself or indeed, you know, across the, the East Kimberley. Um, and, um, yeah, no, you know, it's been it's been nice. What but, have you learned? Well, we I, we got to spend some time last night with um, many of the uh, volunteer emergency services personnel, so some of the bushfire um, crew, marine rescue crew and SES crew. And it was great to catch up with them. I mean, these are all volunteers, so they work day jobs in a range of areas, councils, small businesses, some work for themselves. But at the drop of a hat, when there's a fire or a flood, they drop everything mm. and they go and put a fire out or save people from, you know, including a person who was out at Lake Argyle the last couple of days, save someone there or, or um, catch people who, you know, who, whose boat sinks. So they are amazing people. It was really good to spend time with them last night and just to say thank you to them. And I would encourage any of your listeners, if anyone was ever interested, we're always looking for volunteers for foreign emergency services. And a few of them have been nominated for the awards this year. That's right. We have our WA Foreign Emergency Services Awards right. in September. And some of the, the local um, 
brigades here have been nominated, so they're up for awards because of the amazing job that they do. Uh, fantastic. Um, Davina, you come across a lot. I, I see you now and then wandering through of the airport, passing through the airport. Uh, so you already have your finger on the pulse in terms of, you know, what's going on here and what people are saying. But did you learn something from this week? What are your takeouts? Oh, look, I think considering some of the meetings, uh, some of the ministers went off and had uh, uh, meetings um, with other specific stakeholders, you know, we had a tourism breakfast with a lot of the tour, tourism uh, stakeholders with Minister Safiotti talking about the impacts of tourism, bringing tourism into this region, um, livability. These these were not uh, new to me, the challenges um, and, and the gaps, but I think it was good for our ministers to hear firsthand from the people that it's being impacted on. Uh, we, we had Tony Booty going to East Kimberley College, visiting the school. Um, we had... Uh, Tony Booty and John Kerry looking at the hostel out there that Wunan's running and some of the FDV courses going through that. Um, we had, of course, the town hall meeting or, or the community meeting at the... How did that go? It was good. It was, it was quite good. There was a lot of people. I think there was about 70-odd people there. Um, and there were quite a variety of questions that came from the floor, which was quite good. And it was quite... It was done in quite a respectful way, um, where it was a panel of them sitting up there and, you know, made a little introduction and, and we took questions from the floor. Of course, it takes time to warm up and then all of a sudden, as you're reaching the end, everyone wants to have a question. Mm -hmm. But So um, we didn't, like, cut quite short. We kind of had the opportunity for... Uh, ministers to hang around and people to approach them directly mm -hmm. and have conversations and we followed that up with um, a business after hours at Phoenix Plaza there in the East Kimberley Chamber. Shout out to Tumali who always delivers beautiful food. That environment is um, absolutely wonderful and while I'm on the radio I would like to do a shout out to thank um, Agnes and Dora who did the welcoming for that community hall. Um, always love Agnes. P.S. That, that mural on that wall is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, also, Kida and Kyra from the East Kimberley Chamber who helped us put together Kununurra Picture Garden and um, there's one more. Uh, everyone that helped out today. <laughs> Kununurra Party Hire and the audiovisual guy. But the conversations that came out were, were quite something that I have been aware of. And again, like I said, it was awesome to see and watch and give the opportunity to the people of Kununurra to ask questions directly to the ministers and and have that have those concerns heard directly. So you know they talked about childcare, they talked about housing, they talked about you know the driver equity, some of the service gaps, and giving opinions on on how they can better improve some services and some of the big worries um, that affect the community as a mm. whole as well. Not not just Kanara. We had people from Hall Street there. We had people from Wyndham there as well. Well, we've, that's a good way to end. We've run out of time. Of course, wanted to ask a whole lot more, including uh, getting into some of those issues that people raise. Well, we can do that on your next visit, Davina. Yep. You're always welcome I'll here. I'll be back. Great, as our local member. Just uh, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, just to finish with you, the next election is coming up in March next year. I believe the 8th of March 2025. You'll be campaigning from Broome this time, from the Kimberley. Um, so is the government planning to do a whole a lot more of this? Oh, well, look, we do our community cabinets right across the state. All but leading through, up to all the election the more so? Uh, no, we will certainly, ministers will continue to visit with Davina. I mean, Davina's been a tremendous local member, very engaged. She makes sure that we all know what the issues are that, that are on Kimberley people's minds. But what's been great about this week has been there's only three ministers normally who represent the bush in parliament. So to have ministers from the city come up here, meet local people on the ground, hear the issues firsthand, it means that, you know, hopefully um, we'll get faster action. Great. Here, here. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us. Um, I'll remind the listener, we've been speaking with uh, Stephen Dawson, MLC, uh, whose office is in South Headland, but he's moving up to Broome. He's moved up to Broome. And our local uh, member for the Kimberley, Davina Deanna, joining us this morning. And if you missed it, go back to Facebook Live. The, the video is there. Thank you, both of you. And uh, safe travels back home. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. It is uh, 25 minutes to nine here on our local station.
and uh, we're going to update the news shortly. And then uh, Nathalia, Nathalia Imbalong is going to join me for the last hour of uh, the program. And we're going to let you know about more of the events that are going on around town. You might find me on the back roads of...